Um, our final speaker of the evening is uh, Sinead McSweeney, who is the Director of Public Policy at Twitter for Europe, the Middle East and Africa. So big portfolio there. Um, having joined the social media giant in 2012 from her role as Director of Communications at Angarda Siakana, Sinead obviously has a very key understanding in the importance of privacy. Uh, Sinead, you're very welcome. Everybody who is a Twitter user tweets. Uh, some 40% of our users don't tweet or share information. Uh, they consume information. And there is as much information and use cases for Twitter um, as there are interests that we have in the offline world. Um, we state very clearly uh, right up at the top of our privacy policy, what you say on Twitter may be viewed all around the world instantly. Um, and that is there as a drop quote because we describe Twitter as a public platform. It's not rooms, it's not groups, it's not Snapchat, discover, you know, it's, it's a private, or sorry, it's a public space. There's no, uh, there's no uh, uh, tent on that issue. It's built around small bursts of information, tweets of 140 characters, but increasingly we're adding rich media to that in terms of pictures, videos, uh, links, etc. And let's not forget, the amazing and wonderful things that that facilitates um, in the world, and that's everything from tweet tweeting at an astronaut in the International Space Station and having him reply, uh, through to reuniting lost cats, dogs, and children's toys with their owners. So, you know, the internet is an amazing thing. Um, I don't believe we should all be scared. As a mother of a five-year-old, I don't believe parents should be scared. It was always hard to bring up children. There were always challenges. Problems haven't changed. Our solutions just need to be more innovative. Um, so from that point of view, I don't want to lose sight of uh, the amazing resource that we have literally in our pockets and at our fingertips on a daily basis, which allows us to connect um, not just with family and friends, but with the world around us and find ourselves intimately in the moment of an event um, or a new 
new story, be it good or bad, that is breaking uh, somewhere on this planet. So in terms of Twitter across the world, we have um, 500 million uh, unique users um, in a month, 284 um, in total. Um, the big figure there, and, and Owen touched on it, is 1 billion tweets um, every two days. So that's the volume of information that's being shared on Twitter, and that's in 35 languages. Um, and uh, in terms of our corporate footprint, um, we have just over uh, 3,500 employees. So actually, in the scale of things, compared to some of our uh, so-called uh, industry peers, uh, we're actually quite small um, in terms of the resources that are keeping this um, incredible platform and resource um, alive uh, across the planet. Um, increasingly, our users are outside the US, um, and increasingly, our users um, are on mobile. Uh, and I think a lot of the other speakers have referenced that, that the move is to a uh, smartphone and apps rather than desktop sharing. So um, I touched on um, kind of some of the sense of what I was going to say earlier, but when, when I talk and when I think about privacy myself um, and my own interactions online, I think of it in terms of uh, my privacy vis-a-vis -vis, um, other users of the particular platform or people who may not be users of that platform, and I make personal decisions about my phone level settings, about my platform settings, similar to what Jean spoke about. Um, but even it goes for me, it goes beyond settings, and there's this sense of personal responsibility. And I often say, again, that when faced with a so-called online problem, if you think about the offline equivalent, the solution kind of tends to come to you. So just as we dress appropriately for wherever we're going on a daily basis, um, and, or make sure that we're prepared um, for whatever we're going to meet, if we're meeting, you know, if we're meeting family, um, or if we're going to mass, we're going to dress and behave differently uh, from how we would if we're going out for the night. So similarly, I make decisions about how I use um, the, different, the different platforms and resources that are there. Similar, si like Jean, um, I have a, a five-year-old son, and I have never shared a picture of his face on Twitter because I have seven and a half thousand followers on Twitter. I don't know who many of them are. I have shared pictures of him with a small group um, of Facebook friends that I have who are actually friends and family. Uh, I met somebody recently whom I had worked with in Northern Ireland who hadn't seen me since Seamus was a baby and said to me, oh, have you looked at him? He said, oh, so that's what you look like. I've been looking at the back of your head for the last five years. Um, so, you know, but those are personal decisions um, that I make. And things like strong passwords, things like two-factor authentication. So those are, those are the decisions we should all be making as users uh, to determine our privacy vis-a-vis -vis all of the other people that are out there. And yes, we compromise those for convenience. So yes, we have location um, turned off, uh, but then we find ourselves in a strange city and we're trying to find a restaurant and we go to Yelp and we go, yes, yes, location, yes, please, please tell me where the nearest pharmacy is. Um, and we are giving up those elements of privacy for the, for the convenience and the, and the, the, the no the service that we're trying to access. We wipe that out as a result. The second element of privacy um, is your privacy vis-a-vis -vis the company or platform, the person who has um, your, or the company who has your, your information. And from our point of view, um, that is about um, being open and transparent about what, what information we have on users, um, what we do with that information, um, and making sure that there is great clarity in the privacy policy and also easy functionality in terms of the different opt-outs that people can have to control <coughs> their own experience on the platform. So if you go to twitter.com today and decide <coughs> to open a Twitter account. Owen mentioned you know, filling out forms. Well, this is pretty much what you have to fill out to join Twitter today. You give us a name, it doesn't have to be your name. You give us an email address. It can be an email address that you just get off the internet somewhere right this minute. It doesn't have to be your email address um, that you use for your work or family or, or anything else. Um, and you choose a strong password, a stress strong password. Um, and you choose a username. Um, none of those have to be, as I say, real, and um, they don't have to be your existing email address today. Um, you won't see a box there asking you for a date of birth uh, or gender, um, and that's it. So um, a good 
friend of mine uh, some years ago did open just such an account um, and it chose to be Shield Citizen and has had an account on Twitter as Shield Citizen for the last three years. The reason why we allow pseudonymous accounts um, is, is two or, or two or threefold. Um, one is again this idea that should be able to have an existence, particularly if, you're, if you have a commitment to freedom of expression, it's important to also allow anonymous speech. So we have people who have used um, Twitter in areas of conflict, be they journalists, uh, be they um, you know, political dissidents, human rights activists, but you don't have to go to those dramatic examples. You can look at young people who, for one reason or another, um, maybe because they're struggling with mental health issues, maybe they're struggling with their sexuality, at a different points in their lives, want to be able to share information, learn information, be part of a community where they can be open and participate in conversations, but to do so anonymously. And that is something that we value as a platform very highly. I'll come uh, later in the, in, in the presentation if we have time to the obvious challenges which come from championing anonymity. Um, but it, at, at the same time, in terms of our commitment to privacy and user privacy, we believe uh, that it's very important. It has the added benefit that we um, encourage and love um, all of the parody accounts which um, grow up on Twitter and we, we regularly share our, our particular favorites um, at any given time. And again, uh, that is something that is encouraged and embraced uh, by the platform and by the company. However, Sheila decided that rather than just um, going uh, with a pseudonym, that she actually <coughs> didn't want people to see her tweets, that she really just wanted to be a consumer so she accepted one follower who I know very well um, and uh, has just been deciding to follow others. So she's just consuming tweets and, and not wanting anybody uh, to look. So she has that option within her settings to protect her tweets. Not a lot of our users do that, um, but it is, it is something that is there and available to them. So <coughs> in you know, Sheila's experience is that she's gathering and, and uh, consuming all the information that is being shared by these accounts that, that she's following while they're also sharing that information um, with others and receiving um, information from people as well. The interesting thing about that is as the one person who follows Sheila, I can see who she follows. So you know, I could kind of maybe guess that she's a Trinity student and um, that she gets the Lewis into, um, into, uh, into uh, the city center every morning. You know, she has a, a sense of humor. She's obviously started watching Red Rock recently, um, et cetera. Uh, just to go back there, um, and uh, you know, maybe looking at a career in politics. But again, because Sheila has chosen uh, to have a protected account, um, I am the only person who can see that. I, on the other hand, have taken a different decision. Owen spoke about 200 tweets can tell you your personality. Well, actually, just looking at the last, she has very quickly, 12 accounts um, that I followed would indicate that um, in recent weeks, um, I, uh, you know, just on the basis of the people I followed in the last week, I most likely have a child. Um, I have um, an interest in photography. I have definitely have some connection going on with Garda Shikana because I have the lovely Paul Brennan from Red Rock, but also uh, the GeForce LGBT account uh, from uh, LGBT, LGBT support group uh, within Garda Shikana. <coughs> and uh, clearly there's something going on between me and Turkey at the moment. Um, so <laughs> There you go, that's just, uh, that's just 12 accounts. Um, but I'm happy with that. I know that that's, that is part of, of the profile of me that is available to the user. But I do have the option not to share even that information if I don't need to. Um, why would people choose to have protected accounts or not to tweet? Again, let's not lose sight of the amazing <coughs> resource that Twitter is. Um, and, and you know, we saw it writ large uh, just a couple of weeks ago with the tragic um, events that unfolded in Paris and that it gave the ability for people to actually rally around in support um, and to, to show how they felt about uh, what had happened in, those, in, in that time. And we actually had a similar experience in Sydney um, some weeks back when uh, the I Rise With You hashtag started where people um, offered to accompany uh, young, uh, not so young, Muslims on public transport who uh, were fearful that they might be attacked. I mentioned the second element, 
which is the privacy of our users vis-a-vis -vis us as a company. So every user has what you might call a dashboard of settings, um, and they can go through those and decide. Some of them are default on, some are default off. So for example, location is default, default off. You have to have an active decision um, to decide to add your location uh, to your tweet. And things like the way in which we interact with you. We have your email address. And if it is your own personal email address, you know, you don't want 20 emails a day uh, from Twitter, so you can choose not to have 20 emails a day from Twitter. Or indeed, um, you can switch off notifications. You can switch off notifications for certain times of the day, for example, maybe while you're sleeping, which is a very good idea if you have lots of US colleagues who are eight hours behind you. Um, <laughs> although, again, when you talk about the amazing and nice moments that can occur on Twitter, I was, was woken one night at about one o'clock in the morning by a notification of a, a mention in a tweet, and it was from the Irish New York consulate, who were with my uncle, who was a priest in West Virginia, at the uh, unveiling of a, of a Celtic cross, and tweeted me to say, hey, we're with your uncle, he's very popular here in West Virginia, which was actually a really nice moment that, again, would never have happened if it were not for Twitter, that I got a sense of the regard in which my uncle uh, was held. And Again, we're very clear and transparent and focus on trying to have simple, comprehensive uh, language around <coughs> cookies. I mean, cookies, cookies are um, a necessity to ensure that people's experience on the internet is quick and that it's you know, sufficiently interactive, that you, know, that you don't want to be reloading the same things every time. Again, this is the convenience versus uh, personal privacy. Twitter was uh, one of the very first companies to um, build in and adopt Do Not Track in the US uh, as a one-click option that you just indicate that you do not want your browser history information um, to be used uh, to, to make suggestions uh, for tailoring for you. In actual fact, the, the issue of turning on or turning off um, Do Not Track in Europe doesn't arise because we don't use browser um, history in, um, in Europe to to um, make tailored suggestions. And similarly, when we offer the facilities to developers, when they're designing websites and incorporating tweet buttons, etc., to respect uh, people's do not track uh, preferences. And again, there was lots of political support for that um, in the US uh, when it was launched because um, it, there has been a lot of controversy about the need to, to put this facility um, into browsers. I mentioned location. Again, you have the option you know, at the high level just to add location to your tweets, but then also within individual tweets, you can choose to add or not add uh, location. You can also delete all location information subsequently. Similarly, deleting a tweet um, is very straightforward. You click it, it's gone. <coughs> Issue um, that, that, has, that, that was touched on in, in, in terms of knowing, you know, what it is your history on the platform is. So again, very simple to download an archive of your tweets, and some people may choose to actually download that archive before they delete their account. So they have it themselves, um, but then it is um, it's also gone. You do have a 30-day cooling off period when people choose to delete an account because we have learned through bitter experience that people decide to uh, delete their accounts in a, in a moment of uh, either kind of 1st of January, I'm done with social media, um, <laughs> or just anger or peak, and then, you know, sometime later decide they want their Twitter account back, and they're like, oh, I have to build up all my followers again, and I was so popular, and how am I going to do this? And we say, it's okay, because within 30 days, you can have all your followers and your settings back. But after 30 days, um, it's gone. So just a few thoughts to, to finish up. I mean, Owen talked about the, the commercial realities of this and how you know, the, the data is currency. I'm like Jean, I actually hate talking about this thing because it's like using data, data, privacy, mm -hmm. privacy. Uh, but anyway, Fidelo um, Ferraro. Um, so yes, there is a commercial reality. Like none of these companies are charities. You know, we exist to provide a service and ultimately, hopefully, someday to make a profit. Um, and
And uh, so, so there is a commercial reality, of course there is. But within that commercial reality is also the bit about providing a better service. And yes, they are linked and it's circular. Um, but there is a benefit to, ha to the user to having a certain amount of information about them in order to ensure that the product that they have chosen to use um, is better. But again, for us, it's the element within the chosen to use that they're, they're making that choice um, based on you know, full of information that we are open and transparent about our policies. And when they change, uh, we ensure that we inform users. And that's not just by an email that might get bin because it's another email uh, from, from a company, but also by in-app prompts uh, and that people have to then consent <coughs> to uh, the change. Um, I mentioned the difficulties and challenges of adherence to principles like freedom of expression and user privacy. And you know, I think there are many examples of where um, those, those, those challenges can be seen, but none more so than what we have um, experienced in recent months with a changing world and growing terrorist threat, where companies like Twitter, who have um, a strong commitment to freedom of expression um, and for user privacy, are, are you know, facing increasing um, requests. And we've seen a lot of political um, <coughs> conversations and debates about the kinds of content that should be allowed on platforms. So you know, do we have pressure to um, remove or not allow certain types of content, but also then to <coughs> share information about those who are uh, posting that content. Twitter has a long track record in this area of withstanding those kinds of requests and insisting on valuable process. Um, and where we do um, share user information, um, not only uh, that is published every six months in our transparency report so we clear to the world how many ad requests we have received and, and how many we have acceded to. On the content removal side, um, we also uh, publish any requests that we comply with, which in fact the, the full details of those are there. Owen talked about the frightening state and the frightening company, but actually I think we're a step beyond that because it is in some instances it is the companies who are standing with their hand up to the frightened state and saying, no, just because you can, doesn't mean you should. Thank you very much.